Hi everyone, and welcome back to the lab. In this video, I'll be isolating tetrachloroethylene from a common household product. I'll then be demonstrating some of the uses of tetrachloroethylene, both around the house and in industry, and I'll be isolating this because I'll be using it in an upcoming video. Tetrachloroethylene is a water-clear, dense hydrocarbon liquid that's also sometimes called perchloroethylene or sometimes just perk. And the reason that uh, perchloroethylene is called perchloroethylene is that uh, generally per something compounds, so like perchloro compounds for instance, have uh, all the hydrogens replaced with uh, whatever comes after the per. So perchloro means that uh, this is ethylene that has all the hydrogens replaced with chlorines. And you can see that's here. Ethylene or ethene, uh, as you might learn from the IUPAC name, uh, with all the hydrogens that are possible replaced of chlorine. Something like perchloroethane would actually be hexachloroethane. Uh, perchloroethylene is uh, basically uh, tetrachloroethylene. And then you could have something like, say, uh, perchloroacetylene, which would be basically dichloroethane. So if you get the nomenclature, uh, that's good. Anyway, uh, it's a water clear liquid. Like I said, it's a dense hydrocarbon um, and it boils at 121 Celsius. You can find it uh, at the store in the form of brake cleaner. This is the non flammable formula. Make sure that's the non flammable formula that's important because the flammable formula only contains things like toluene and methanol and acetone and uh, obviously no tetrachloroethylene. However, this stuff, which I believe is being phased out, so get it while you still can, uh, if you look at the MSDS or the back of the can, it says contains tetrachloroethylene and carbon dioxide, which leads me to believe that this is pretty much pure tetrachloroethylene that's propelled by carbon dioxide. Unfortunately, though, some manufacturers do include a rust inhibitor to keep the can from rusting on the inside uh, in with the formula, and they don't have to disclose that on the MSDS because it's in such a low concentration. So I'll be uh, going ahead uh, distilling this to make sure that uh, my product is pure for my upcoming reaction, and we can also use that uh, time to explore some of the properties of tetrachloroethylene and its use, particularly in the dry cleaning industry. So let's go to the lab and uh, try some stuff. All right, so what I'm going to do is uh, first I'm going to ascertain how much brake clean is in here, how much tetrachloroethylene that is. There's 539 grams. This is a 500 milliliter flask, and this has a density uh, much higher than that of water. So I'll be fine uh, with the capacity of the 500 milliliter flask to empty this entire can. Uh, to empty it, I'll do the same thing I did in my diethyl ether video. I've placed this in the freezer. Uh, it's not quite frozen yet, but it's still rather cold. Tetrachloroethylene has a much higher boiling point than diethyl ether, so you don't really need to get it as cold. Anyway, I'll be putting it, I'll, I'll put in the straw on the can, and then the, uh, the straw will be inserted into this side arm here, and I'm gonna push it as far down into the flask as I can. And then I'm gonna go ahead and squirt the entire can into this flask. Uh, up here I have a reflux condenser. There's no water in it or anything, but it's mainly just to keep the splashing down. Um, and it'll keep uh, most of the vapors condensed, considering they'll condense at 121 Celsius, and it'll be coming out of the can uh, much colder than that. So anyway, let's go ahead and do that. Yep, that's about it. Shake this around, make sure I get the last bit of it. Vent the propellant, which is just the carbon dioxide, of course. All right, and that is one empty can. You can see now there's no pressure in it. So you can squish it pretty easily. And there is the tetrachloroethylene, uh, probably saturated with CO2 still, but we're gonna go ahead and distill that, which will easily get rid of that. Um, and you can see that it's a very dense liquid, right? This is a little over 500 grams of it, and it's uh, coming up a little over halfway of a 500 milliliter flask. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and set this up for simple distillation. All right, so I've set up for simple distillation, as you can probably see. I've got my one liter heating mantle here with a lab jack underneath so I can remove the heat. I've got the flask full of tetrachloroethylene uh, down here sitting in the mantle, nice and tight. I've got the uh, still head here with a thermometer well down in here, although we won't be taking the temperature, it's just sort of to plug up the still head. Um, I've got a 300 millimeter Liebig condenser here, or I'm sorry, that's actually a 200 millimeter Liebig, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn the water onto that right now. Adjust the flow rate. That should be good. It's a fairly high boiling point uh, chemical, so it doesn't really take too much water flow to fully condense. Um, and then of course I've got a collection flask here, which is about the same size as the uh, distillation flask, or the boiling flask that is, uh, just because we're gonna distill pretty much all of it over. Oh yes, and also I need to add some boiling chips. All right, so I'm just gonna add some of these little uh, pieces of crushed porcelain. They're uh, boiling chips. Never had these to a hot flask. This flask is uh, still icy cold. I only just turned on the heat, but uh, 
what they do is they facilitate the boiling of the mixture, which uh, allows it to boil evenly rather than uh, superheat and then uh, all of a sudden explode into bubbles and repeat the process, and that's called bumping, and a lot of times that results in issues with getting the, uh, the, this, the stuff in this that you're not wanting to get down in the condenser, uh, it'll shoot up into here and blow its way all the way to the receiver, which is not good. And anyway, you can see the CO2 is coming out of solution just with the addition of those boiling chips. That is not boiling, this is uh, icy cold still. So uh, we'll sit there and uh, let that continue to drive CO2 off, which obviously will not collect in this flask, and uh, pretty soon we'll be distilling off tetrachloroethylene. While we're waiting for that to boil, I think I'm going to have a quick snack of, uh, I don't know, microwave popcorn. I love microwave popcorn. It's, uh, frankly, it's delicious. Oh, darn. Well, it looks like I'm all out of microwave popcorn, but, uh, you know, it would have been dangerous to eat it with these gloves on anyway, so I guess now I can just, uh, maybe do my homework. Oh, no, look what's happening. My homework is now full of oily fingerprints. Well, that's not good. You can see, you can see right through that. Well, what do I do with this now? I need to get this oil off, I can't turn them in like this. But if I rinse it with water, I might destroy it. I guess we could try it. Let's go see. All right, now that we're back in the lab, we can look at my homework and you'll notice it's completely decimated. There's lots of oil all over this. That's disgusting. So uh, we're gonna have to do something about that. So let's try some water. I'll put, uh, I don't know, let's say this one. We'll put it in water and see if I can get that oil out of there. I'll just dunk that in like that. Uh-oh. Well, something bad appears to be happening. It looks like the lines are coming off the paper. Uh, not only that, but the ink is also starting to run. Hmm. Well, I guess I could try and add some soap and maybe get this oil out of it, but uh, I'm not sure that's going to work. Huh. Well, we'll leave that in there for a while and just see, see what happens. Of course, uh, the demo I'm trying to do here is, uh, is dry cleaning, right? This is a perfect application for dry cleaning. Um, clothes that cannot uh, touch water, basically, or they'll shrink or otherwise degrade, are often cleaned using tetrachloroethylene solutions. And so uh, that's what we're going to do here. In fact, with this second piece of paper, which is all oily, uh, we're going to go ahead and rescue this piece of homework um, using tetrachloroethylene, and uh, we'll have this one as our control, which is now sitting in water uh, with an attempt to do the same thing. So let's go uh, soak this in tetrachloroethylene and see what happens. All right, I placed it in the beaker, and I'm gonna go ahead and use another can of uh, this, since I used it all. Uh, the other can is entirely in this distillation apparatus waiting to boil right now. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and use some of this, and just sort of spray it on. See what happens. All right, so what I'm doing now is just some uh, some agitation, like a washing machine, and uh, except this washing machine has tetrachloroethylene in it, and this one has, well, water. And you can see the paper that's been in the water isn't faring so well. The ink is starting to run and the lines are completely gone from the paper, whereas the one that's in the tetrachloroethylene is still actually crisp. Isn't that crazy? And that's because the cellulose in the paper has a lot of hydroxyl groups on it and it's rather attracted to water, uh, but not tetrachloroethylene since it's so uh, nonpolar. So anyway, uh, you can go ahead and basically wash greasy uh, deposits out of water-sensitive materials like paper or wool clothes or things like that, other uh, suits and things like that that need to be dry cleaned uh, without damaging them. And that's uh, that's really the whole premise behind dry cleaning. All right, so I've finished agitating these and uh, we'll go ahead and pull them out and I'm gonna set them on some, uh, some paper towel and we'll check and see their condition uh, in a minute. All right, there's the tetrachloroethylene sample. And this will be the water sample. While we're waiting for those two samples to dry, you'll notice that the tetrachloroethylene is starting to boil in the flask, and we are just now getting a vapor front. It's about there, and uh, pretty soon it will move up the still head and we'll be collecting product. All right, the tetrachloroethylene is boiling rather well now. You can see it's uh, vapor is coming over quite rapidly into the still head, moving into the condenser and uh, condensing. And we are now collecting it in this flask, and uh, it'll be ready for storage after that. So it should be uh, maybe 20 more minutes for the rest of that to boil over. We can uh, pretty much distill the dryness on this one, since we don't expect to form any explosive peroxides or anything, and the temperature isn't particularly hot, so we're not uh, going to crud up the flask or anything. So uh, right when it gets down to just a little bit, I'll pull the mantle off, and maybe the rest of the distill over, maybe it won't, but I don't plan to leave more than maybe 10 or 20 milliliters in there. 
So now let's check back up on our samples uh, of homework that were greasy and washed with two different methods. The water wash method is a complete disaster. You can see that there's still oil all over it. Um, the paper is completely crinkly. The message is a little bit blurred, although the ink did hold up remarkably well. Uh, the ink that was on the lined paper did not fare so well, and there are no more lines in the paper save for these margin lines here. So uh, yeah, you couldn't turn that in. That's a complete mess. However, the one that was washed in tetrachloroethylene is completely pristine. The paper is crisp looks like a new sheet of paper um, and the message is fine. The lines are present, this would get an A plus and no one would even know that you got your nasty popcorn your fingers all over it. So uh, the same concept, uh, this dry cleaning concept, right, cleaning without water, so dry cleaning, uh, works both on homework and your suit. So when you spill mastacholi on yourself next time you're at a wedding and you need to have your suit dry cleaned, this is what they do. And that's because a lot of the fabrics used in suits and stuff like that are uh, sensitive to water, right, they're like wool and other materials like that. So anyway, um, that's about dry cleaning in a nutshell. All right, the distillation is now coming to a halt. You can see there's not really much uh, tetrachloroethylene left, and whatever is in there will have uh, concentrated impurities in it. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the heat off, stop that, and uh, you can see over here pretty much a uh, quantitative yield of the tetrachloroethylene. Obviously, this is just a purification run. So. Um, I'll just let this cool down, and as soon as it stops uh, distilling over, I can go ahead and transfer that to a storage bottle for use in an upcoming video. As the boiling comes to a halt, it becomes more apparent that we did in fact have uh, some impurities that we distilled out, as evidenced by the yellow color in there. So that's good, whatever that is, maybe rust inhibitors, or who knows, could be rust from the can or something. Don't know. Uh, anyway, at least it's not in there, and that is all that counts. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, pour this into the storage bottle. And here is the freshly distilled tetrachloroethylene. It's uh, surprisingly heavy for its size. It's uh, much more dense than water. It's uh, kind of a neat compound. Anyway, I'll be using this, like I said, in an upcoming video. I'll be reacting it with something else. Uh, it's a secret, but uh, if you can guess, put your guess in the comments, and I'll let you know maybe if you're right or not. Uh, or if not, we can wait till the next video. But uh, if you want to see that, make sure you're subscribed, as always. Uh, if you like this video, please press the like button. And if you'd like to throw me a dollar or something to help me continue to make these videos, I have a Patreon account. I'll put the link in the description. And as always, thank you very much for watching.